Hello. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, and I'm really grateful to the Gyan Darshan for giving me this opportunity to speak about the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code enacted by the Parliament is one of the best legal reforms ever undertaken by any government in the past. It can be said the code is a jewel in the Indian statute book. When I say that the code is a jewel in the Indian statute book, Indian statute book is very rich and varied, and we have seen many laws over the past hundred years, but this one stands out for many reasons. Now, this is a result of a new way of law reform attempted by the government and it is likely to shape how laws will be made in the future. How it is, how it is different and how it stands out, I will come to it later. But let me give you a broad introduction of my, my thinking and my experiences as a chairman of the Bankruptcy Law Reforms Committee, uh, which I labored very hard for two years. And I, and I gave the report to the then Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jaitley, on November 6, 2015. The, the court has seen rapid progress. It has been accompanied by a rich ecosystem and a commitment from the government to keep in touch with the current realities. No other law has, uh, has engaged the attention of the government and resources of the government and the court as the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Now, what is this importance about this code? Why is it so different? How it stands apart from the other laws made by the Parliament? Now, the code <coughs> tries to attempt to reform the credit market. The existing state of credit market at the at 2000, prior to the enactment of the code, was in a very bad shape. What happened? Let us try to recapitulate the conditions prevailing before the enactment of the code and let us see how the code tries to address all these issues and problems and challenges. Now, initially, when a business starts, when a business is successful, sometimes it may not be in a position to pay its debt, in inability to pay its creditors. And this leads to a lot of difficulties. Now, inability to pay a debt is the sort of thing, is not the same thing as uh, uh, insolvency. It is something which is very different. And we have to address this issue because inability to pay a debt is seen as, a, uh, as a, that it involves a default and it involves malfeasance. And all the promoters who are responsible for this should be taken to task. This is the idea which was in the thinking of all the financial markets and this led to a lot of quagmires. No, risk taking is essential for entrepreneurship, to build entrepreneurship at a time when the government, governments all over the world are withdrawing from the paternalistic role which they assumed during the collectivist era and privatization and liberalization and market forces are ruling our lives, it is necessary for people to take the initiative and create opportunities and jobs and, and contribute to the well-being of the economy and financial markets. Now, risk-taking, how is it encouraged? How will you encourage them? In any healthy economy, <laughs> firms, are make, the firms make decisions. Sometimes they make risky, they take risky plans. Some plans always may go wrong and which will, in, which will induce default. If default is equated with malfeasance, then this can only have a chilling effect on risk-taking which would hamper risk-taking by firms. This will be an undesirable outcome. Limited Liability Corporation, all of us know, is a wellspring of uh, entrepreneurship. Now, it is an important mechanism conceived by the English law, I mean, the Solomon vs. Solomon, where they said the company is different from the shareholders. So, in history, Limited Liability Corporation came about precisely with the object of encouraging risk-taking. If, li if liability was unlimited, 
fewer risk projects, riskier projects will be undertaken and the process of acceleration will not be possible. The limited liability corporation gave the shareholders the ability to walk away which enables greater exploration of alternative business models, technology, product design, etc. Now, there is another idea which has been very popular in all our corporate ownership that control of a company is not a divine privilege. The key, a key feature of the relationship between debt and equity is that when a firm defaults on its debt, control of the company should be shifted to the creditors. Malfeasance. What is malfeasance? It is illegitimate transfer of wealth out of the companies by the controlling shareholders. When a company approaches default, managers may, managers may anticipate uh, and, and, and transfer money out to the company and this has to be addressed by the bankruptcy process. So the bankruptcy process must be designed with a particular focus on blocking such behavior, which is undoubtedly malfeasance. Bankruptcy reform in law India has to achieve four objectives. This is how we conceived ourselves when we started working on the project. It should create effective barriers against managers who transfer cash out of a company when the default nears, swiftly shift power from the shareholders to the creditors upon default, enshrine limited liability, enshrine business failure as a normal and legitimate part of working of a market economy. In a market economy, some people depend upon credit. The current state of credit market in India is very poor. It is a poor environment. It's poor because there is absence of debt financing. Bond market was not uh, very viable. The natural financing strategy for all countries is for large companies to obtain all the debt financing from the bond market. But in India, this channel has been choked off because the corporate bondholders obtain particularly very bad recovery rates under the present legal framework. Secondly, there is a misplaced <laughs> emphasis upon secured credit. There is always a necessity for somebody to produce a security to get finance. At present, many lenders are comfortable giving loans only against collateral. The concept of looking at the cash flows of a company and giving loans against that is absent. This has created an emphasis on debt financing for firms who have fixed assets. Surfacy does not allow the firm to survive as a going concern. Surfacy was touted as a, a great uh, legislation when it was enacted in the, near, near the beginning of 2000, but it does not allow the firm to survive as a going concern. When a firm has secured credit and fails on its obligations, the present legal, the, the, the surfacy framework emphasizes secured creditors taking control of the assets which were pledged to them. No, when the present lever does not allow the possibility of protecting the firm as a going concern while protecting the clash cash flows of the secured creditors. No, the hurdles in the present liquidation process under the present legal framework before the enactment of the code, what were the hurdles in the process of liquidation? There are many. There was inordinate delay. From the viewpoint of creditors, a good realization can generally be obtained if the firm is sold as a going concern. We all agree, but there's no disagreement on that. Hence, in liquidation, the realization is lower when there are delays. <coughs> the, the delay causes value destruction. And this, for, a high, a high, for receiving a higher value rec recovery rate, we have to both identify and com combating the sources of delay. What were the causes for delay? Lack of information about the assets and liabilities of the debtors. That is the first cause. There is a, what we call asymmetry of information between the creditors and debtors. 
this works out in a very different way under the present arrangement considerable time can be lost before parties obtain this information about the debtor's condition disputes about these facts can take up to years to resolve in courts this is a part of a asymmetry then adjudicatory delays this the second important source of delay is adjudicatory mechanisms prior to the enactment of the ibc we had multiple multiplicity of fora we had multiplicity of fora we had cross litigations and then in order to address this we had to see a unified process in which there will be a single authority to deal with all these things so we created the national company law tribunals for corporate debtors and debt recovery tribunals for individuals in partnership firms what are the essentials of a good for a good bankruptcy law a key element of credit con credit contract is predictability around what happens if the borrower cannot repay it may be possible the debtor has to restructure payments and this requires conversation between the creditors and the debtors bankruptcy law should facilitate this conversation that's exactly what this code addresses the mechanism has to be so designed that the debtor can renegotiate the payment and the creditor can enforce the payment at the same time the creditor needs to be prohibited from coercive collection that's where we have this moratorium both creditors and debtors need to know that the decisions will be taken swiftly initially <laughs> bankruptcy and insolvency depended upon the net worth erosion test sika as it stood before the sik industrial undertaking companies act it believed in net worth erosion test where the net worth is eroded beyond 51% then it is <coughs> insolvent but then by the time you detect this net worth erosion test there is nothing left in the company to recover so we went in for a default based test early recognition of financial distress is very important for timely resolution of insolvency so a default based test provides a simple test to initiate the resolution process so we have to change from the net worth erosion test to the default based test a single law for dealing with insolvency and bankruptcy of all entities was lacking before the code so this was addressed by the enactment of the code provisions related to insolvency and bankruptcy for companies were found in different statutes one in the sick industries companies special provisions act 1985 then the recovery of debt due to banks and financial institutions act 1993 then the securitization securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of security interest act 2002 and the companies act 2013 this is for corporate corporates then for individuals provisions related to individual insolvency in the old acts of presidency towns insolvency act of 1908 and provincial insolvency act of 1920 where the jurisdiction lay with the district courts now the code when was enacted at a time when other legislations were being stuck in parliament for various reasons very amazingly political parties cutting across political lines cooperated and the code went before the joint committee of parliament it was unanimously agreed and then it was enacted into law in a quick in a record time and 2016 it was made into law once the act was enacted the code was enacted the government swung into action and it created the necessary ecosystems necessary for the implementation of the code <coughs> and as the first step it it created the insolvency and bankruptcy board of india and it had a very dynamic chairman mr sahu and it went on implementing the code in a very systematic and scientific manner now as i told you the insolvency and bankruptcy code is a jewel in the indian statute book there is a reason for stating the statement 
I have drafted many legislations and I have been watching, I mean, privy to many uh, acts of parliament for more than three decades. Law reform movement in India has not taken off much. We had law reforms, we had law commissions. I had been in law commission also as a member secretary. Our re our research was concentrated upon doctrinal research. Empirical research, socio-legal research, impact analysis, these were all lacking under the Indian legal conditions. Laws were made dependent upon accidents of litigation or somewhere there is a public outcry, some crisis has occurred. So it depended upon the accidents of litigation. A time has come where you have to undertake measuring the impact of laws. How do you measure the impact of laws? You need data. You need field studies. You need to go empirical data, which is the soul of law reform. In India, Indian law, we have the Indian the, the Income Tax Act and all the Excise Act and the Customs Act, these revenue laws, where every year during the budget session, all these laws will be amended for the purpose of collecting revenue. So the government undertakes this annual exercise of uh, annual exercise during the budget budget session. Now this is done on the basis of uh, data. All these uh, financial bills are based upon data. The government knows how much revenue will be generated if you amend this law and they all were aware what product with tax will raise what amount of revenue, income to the government. No other law has such a mechanism of measuring the effectiveness or the impact of laws. But insolvency in bankruptcy code is now based purely upon empirical research. It is a piece of economic legislation. The relationship between law and economics is always very complex. And in the globalized economy, and this is getting into a very complex area where law and economics are bundled together. Legal concepts are becoming very more, uh, more difficult to understand for lawyers and judges, and things are happening at a great speed because of the digital revolution, and markets are global. Now, when you say law and economics have an array, a very complex relationship, it has always been complex, but with the with the economy growing at a great speed, it has become very difficult to understand and measure. The insolvency and bankruptcy code right now is poised to take advantage of this data. We all speak about big data. We talk about data analytics. We speak about data sciences. Data is now emerging as a big science. And judicial statistics is emerging you will find a new discipline is emerging where you can always predict patterns. This big data about the corporate debtors will enable the financial marketers for financial creditors to undertake a correct decision. So decisions about the viability of the firm or about a company to be wound up or liquidated will be a market decision based upon decisions of the market players and the committee of creditors will be the right persons to take a decision. It should not be a justiciable decision which could be litigated before a court. So this was a primary focus of the code. The finance minister, Mr. Jetley, was very, very sure. And he emphatically told us that this should not end up in the courts where litigation will lead to long protracted time delays. So we made sure that it's a market-based decision, it should be dependent upon market forces, and then the courts should not interfere unnecessarily. Now the code is a very complex code because we have to undertake a thorough analysis of what were the existing laws, and we have to amend each one of them. It is a comprehensive code and comprises of 252 sections and 11 schedules. <coughs> Now, how the, I told you how the insolvency in bankruptcy code attempts to address all these concerns, we, how it is different, and the most, most important difference is the reduction of multiple judicial fora 
into two tribunals only before that we had so many courts interfering now we had only two tribunals who were dealing with this insolvency matters the NCLT, nclt for corporates and data for for these individuals and partnership firms decisions as to insolvency solvency or otherwise of a enterprise will be a market decision prescribing timelines strict timelines for different stages of proceedings is another hallmark of this code yearly detection of sickness by companies it is inability to pay a debt rather than 51% of erosion of net worth recognizing a new breed of tech insolvency professionals and recognizing information utilities which ensures symmetry of information between the creditors and debtors and establishing a robust regulator the insolvency in bankruptcy code so these were the five pillars on which we erected the code and they are and it is we are working very well part 2 of the code deals with insolvency resolution and liquidation of corporates no i will not go into details because uh, i will only broadly summarize what were the thinking when we conceived this idea <laughs> no the corporate insolvency we also provided for a fast track corporate insolvency where for certain corporate debtors where it is cuts cuts the timeline and then instead of voluntary liquidation of comp- companies they can go through this process because the ease of doing business world bank has said in india to wind up a company also it takes 2 years so they wanted a very easy way of winding up if somebody doesn't want to carry on the business they should be free to wind up and walk away without any liabilities no the national company law tribunal has, and the company law appellate tribunal they are the adjudicatory authorities for the corporates ideally we should have had a bankruptcy court like what they have in other countries us has a bankruptcy court and the bankruptcy judges are there but in india we already have too many tribunals and there has been lot of criticism about the functioning of the tribunals saying that do no they do not contribute much to the um, delay to the delay or to the backlog in the again they go and clog the courts but we have to address this issue of creating a new tribunal and starting a fresh will take a long time so we decided to entrust the stars to the national company law tribunal and company law appellate tribunal which are already existing and then it was easy to carry on this workload than to create a new tribunal then we had debt recovery tribunals for individual and for partnership <coughs> insolvency now this debt recovery tribunals as far as individual and partnership insolvency is concerned that provision has not been brought, brought into force because we have not we are just seeing the emergence of a separate bankruptcy jurisprudence and it will take some time for <clears throat> people to understand the impact of insolvency law because because imp- ins- people are in the habit of borrowing and then they are not in the habit of uh, keeping up their promise it can lead to lot of difficulties and individual insolvency could lead to lot of social problems so we have to really sensitize people before we implement this part relating to individual insolvency but as far as personal guarantor is concerned of a corporate insolvency we had to bring him under the company law tribunal because you cannot have parallel um, com- com- parallel tribunal adjudicating upon the same issue so that is why we brought the personal guarantors of corporate insolvency under the corporate insolvency in section 60 subsection 2 and 3 now we have seen what are the salient features of this corporate insolvency we find that most outstanding thing is we have shifted from debtor in position to a creditor creditor in position this was mainly based upon our experience with sika uh, sika industrial companies undertaking act where the debtor in position tended to abuse this process and eat away all the wealth and there's nothing left for the creditors to recover so the management is immediately transformed so we from the debtor in position 
we shifted to credit in possession secondly we also provided for moratorium a calm period before which a restructuring of debts can take place and then the resolution professional comes in and then etc etc the most important thing which i would like to mention where is the priority of debts waterfall provision in the priority of debts what happens government always gets a priority government crown debts historically have always had priority over other other debts but this has been significantly downgraded in the present thing and then subsequent amendments also have made lot of uh, ring fencing of creditors where money laundering allegations come in so this this insolvency in bankruptcy code has attempted to address many first in the financial markets and then it it can it has within a short span of 5 years a bankruptcy jurisprudence has emerged because supreme court has laid down landmark decisions of course recently the the parliamentary committee had occasion to pass some critical reviews on the functioning of the code because the timelines have not been adhered to and lot of things liquidation is uh, uh, i mean the haircut which the companies are undertaking are huge is leading to lot of loss to the financial banks etc but then that these are all issues for issues which are bound to happen when we move from one legal order to another legal order when the transition between one legal order to another legal order there will be there is bound to be some tension and we when we moved from the pre ibc legal order to the post ibc legal order this tension is visibly showing up secondly most of the cases which are clogging the system right now are pre legacy were legacy cases there are cases which arose before the enactment of the code and the court raised to address them and as these issues are solved in future the cases will be all settled in a time bound manner and then it is bound to be a great financial markets will be very healthy the court has been criticized as for another reason how do you measure the success or the impact of any law of parliament there has not been any standard test people say on the on the basis of some individual decision some court decision some individual difficulties you are judging the success or failure of the court every law has a spirit intention of the parliament in enacting its legislation and then the judges which who deal with these cases are concerned with the particular facts of the case so a law has to be read as a whole a statute has to be read as a whole and only from the top to bottom when you take up what did this code achieve the key the spirit of the code lies in this preamble or the enacting formula if you read this i'll read this for you you can have it from the code itself this act is an act to consolidate and amend the laws relating to reorganization insolvency resolution of corporate persons partnership firms and individuals in a time bound manner for maximization of value of assets of such persons to promote entrepreneurship availability of credit and balance the interests of all the stakeholders including alteration in the order of priority of payment of government dues and to establish an insolvency in bankruptcy board of india and for matters connected therewith this is the guiding force which has to guide how the code will be interpreted and applied to individual cases there has been a digression the parliamentary committee had even said the code has failed as fast has failed to <coughs> follow its objectives and it has side tracked i i beg to differ from this judgment of the parliamentary committee for a simple reason laws are not cut carved on stone laws have to respond to social changes the controversy between law should essentially follow and not lead and those who believe the law should be a telling is determined agent in the creating of new social norms is one of the recurring themes in the history of legal thought in the words of friedman it was reflected in the two conflicting issues 
of Savini and Bentham legal scholars will know. When the code was enacted, as I told you, it is one of the first type of things which changed the basis, the legal basis of liability, in, 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 insolvency. So there is bound to be a lot of hardship. We first had the problem of flat owners, apartment owners. This is a unique problem, unique problem. And we, when we drafted the report, we also handled the issue of operational creditors. Operational creditors are not equated with the financial creditors. And financial creditors were given a special status for purpose of uh, resolving the resolution plan and other things. So there is always a criticism that operational creditors do not have voting rights. They have no say in this process of resolution. So when this apartment, this there is a scam where there is a builder could not deliver, there is a, then it, it broke. So we had to amend the law and equate these apartment owners into that of financial creditors. Similarly, on the taking of uh, haircuts, now if a company is not a going concern and if it's allowed to uh, be alive without functioning, all the assets will lose their value, machinery, workforce, everything. So if you don't treat with it like a disease in a timely manner, then you'll have nothing to recover. So what do you do that? So time, time is essence of the whole thing. So we have to take the best out of it, even if you have to take a haircut, a substantial amount of haircut. Law cannot prescribe what should be the amount of haircut because it depends upon individual cases and market conditions. We do not know. So we left it to the wisdom of the com committee of creditors. The committee of creditors are sovereign and we wanted to repose faith in them and if there is a malfeasance, of course, you take them to task. There are a lot of provisions in the code to deal with wrongdoings and malfeasance of different uh, stakeholders. That can be taken care of. It's not very difficult. But then <laughs> the creditors should take the call and that is final. It should not be called into question in any other court of law nor by vigilance or in any, from any other angle. If this is not done, people will be difficult, people will find it difficult to take bold decisions. It's necessary to revive a firm. So these are the things which we created and this law is futuristic in design. I am saying this is futuristic in design for the simple reason. Our pandemic has already forced law legal proceedings in the virtual mode. Lawyers who were initially resisting have now come around and they are now very comfortable with arguing in the courts before a camera. Virtual, virtual courts are in the day. As time moves on, people will be in a position to argue cases and decide without having to move, step out of their houses. And this is going to be the order of the day with this pandemic. The code is futuristic in design. It takes into account these virtual hearings. The debt recovery tribunal has been amended to keep in touch with the electronic filing and other documents because we have taken away the jurisdiction of the district courts from personal insolvency. At the same time, we cannot deny access for the people in the remote places. They should not be compelled to visit the metropolitan cities to access. So we have provided for online hearings and hearings in the district court and the law can be tweaked in to adjust and address these difficulties. We live, I told you, in an age of big data. Data can tell us many things and that is becoming very important. The government has moved simultaneously with uh, enriching this environment by amending the Securitization Act, by creating a central registry where well, all secured creditors, all secured credit, credit will be registered there. And that will deem to be a public notice. And then it has taken this one step forward by creating a lot of uh, legal requirements for public notice. It is also proposing to set up a public registry, central registry, where all financial interests will be made available and all ancillary credit information will also be captured from different sources so that information utilities will be able to reflect 
by touch click of a button to a creditor the financial status of a debtor so it will be easy for the creditor to make a decision on to the viability of funding so these are all some of the challenges and how this code is taking up forward no i believe as the code progresses we will see more a new kind of breed of professionals emerging the resolution professionals their expertise will be very different it's not merely law it's not merely banking it's not merely finance it's all a combination which is leading to new type of uh, discipline and expertise we are going to have cross border insolvency when we drafted the legislation we did not provide for cross border insolvency for the simple reason the necessary ecosystem was absent we didn't have the resolution professionals we didn't have the des- dedicated bankruptcy tribunals then we didn't have the information utilities so we just thought let us first the law be in place then then let us consider this cross border insolvency and we came we have subsequently added this and we have suggested amendments to the act in a cross border insolvency law also which will come the most outstanding feature of this cross border insolvency is what is known as a joint hearings judges of the tribunals the national company law tribunal here will hold joint sitting with the bankruptcy judges of different jurisdictions across the countries an indian judge will sit and hear along with the american bankruptcy judge cases where the cross border in cross border elements are involved this is becoming very important because we have seen in the jet airways case we cannot delay the enactment of this legislation and we will have joint sittings and joint hearings you will be conducting joint hearings and you will be hearing to the law, bankruptcy judges from the other jurisdictions this is really a globalization of the legal profession we already have our judges sitting in international tribunals we have justice sikri sitting in singapore international arbitration court justice madan lokur in the fiji supreme court so indian judicial process is becoming global our judges and lawyers are amazing they are second to none and they can deliver anything our law firms are doing an excellent job our youngsters from these law schools throughout the globe are earning laurels for india so this insolvency in bankruptcy code is going to be a real challenge and this is this is how how future law reform will be made in india and i'm very happy and very glad that as a draftsman of the code i am able to share my feelings about the code which i have drafted thank you